All right, we're back, and <laughs> thanks for waiting. Coffee and donuts are downstairs if you want. Come on, step it up! Speedster yelled as he jogged backwards through the tunnel. Despite the clutters of crystals hanging dangerously low from the ceiling, Speedster had no trouble dodging them for the past ten minutes or so. He grinned goofily as he stepped, waiting for Luna to catch up. Don't you want to beat some baddies? I do. I like crushing them into the ground and laughing in their faces. But then they always slip away before I can really throttle them. Luna was annoyed, rubbing her temples and ease her headache. This hog seriously couldn't stop talking. She ducked underneath a cluster of crystals from above, reaching Speedster's location. You're too slow. He laughed as he literally ran circles around Luna. The she-hog sighed in annoyance before lifting an arm, clotheslining Speedster. The momentum of the Crimson Hedgehog sent him flying forward as he crashed into the tunnel of wall face first. And you need to be more observant, Luna replied as she looked down on the ground, seeing a small streak of powder snow. Luna lifted it up, feeling its texture before her head snapped up and she formed a barrier of ice around herself and Speedster. A fraction of a second later, spirits of ice barraged the two heroes, smashing through the shield with ease. Luna gasped as Flo and slowly turned the corner, icicle dagger spinning around his fingers. I don't think we've met before, he said curtly, bowing as he spoke. His movements were elegant and graceful, as if carefully practiced. With every step he took, a path of ice was left in his footprints. He flashed a brilliant smile at Luna. They call me Iceville, but you may call me Floan. Those who protect mortals sicken me to no end. Like you. Did you hear about the city I annihilated a while ago? It was beautiful. Those people had such perfect deaths, frozen in fear in a palace of ice. You will suffer the same fate. Hyperion! As Floan shouted Hyperion's name, several shining lights began to mesh together next to Floan and formed a body. They solidified together, revealing Hyperion, who had successfully pulled himself together after dissolving into photons. The two villains sneered. Their overwhelming aura would be intimidating to most, but not to Geniforce. Luna narrowed her eyes before lifting a hand into the air. In a swirl of flurries, a beautifully crafted cobalt blade appeared in her hands. Her family's heirloom. Luna swung it a few times to reacquaint herself with the blade's feel. The two groups glared at each other, tensions high in the air. It was Speedster that made the first move, sprinting forward as he unsheathed his sword. Using his speed to propel him forward, he jumped, sword pointed at Flowen. Speedster swung the blade, bringing it down on Flowen's shoulder, who only smiled. Flowen's body began to melt, transforming it to slush on the ground and avoiding the attack completely. The slush then reformed into Flowen as Speedster landed behind the Isofil. Flowen turned slowly, his grin widening creepily. Luna wasn't just standing around, though. She had jabbed her blade at Hyperion, a ripple of cold air following its wake. Hyperion charged towards her, fists glowing with barely contained light energy. He slammed his fist into her side, but reeled backwards from strike grazing his chest. The area that was damaged felt cold, and upon further inspection, was actually frozen. The Titan let out a heated sigh before blasting Luna away from him with a burst of light energy. The She-Hog was prepared, though. She grabbed a nearby crystal and lifted it towards the beam, and deflected it from her face. The beam bounced off another crystal, and another, and another, and another, striking flowing in the back. Flowen roared in pain and fell to a knee, his gritting his teeth. Speedster tackled Hyperion to the ground now, trying to pin the Titan to the ground. Hyperion's mane flared with light briefly, blinding Speedster long enough for Hyperion to land a powerful kick on the hedgehog. Speedster stumbled backwards, shaking his head to try to regain his senses. Luna and Speedster quickly regrouped, holding their swords at the villains. Luna wasn't confident in victory over these two. They were just so powerful, more powerful than she remembered. That was when she felt a cold chill run down her spine. A third being slowly walked down the tunnel, hands in pockets. Luna and Speedster both gasped, eyes wide as the third person joined Flowin and Hyperion. His very presence sent thoughts of despair through Luna's mind. 
She gripped her sword tightly, trying to calm down. She glanced over at the always overconfident speedster, whose hands were shaking. Luna then looked back at the villains. Now she was scared. Chapter 5 Traveling through the tunnel, Blastion glanced at the other two quickly before facing front again. He wasn't exactly comfortable with either of these two beings behind him. Being a bounty hunter, Blastion often didn't bother forging alliances, much less making bonds of friendship. His lava-tipped tail flared somewhat, illuminating the darkening tunnel. He was especially cautious around Xanthos, someone he knew very little about. Blastion wasn't sure if he could trust the cat, and Xanthos knew it. The last encounter these two had wasn't exactly... pleasant, to say the least. Xanthos didn't quite trust Blastion either finding the fox's lifestyle despicable. Hunting people like that and selling them off to who knows where. It was tasteless and deplorable. He held back a storm of sparks as his annoyance grew. He had to focus on the mission right now, not on the bounty hunter. I'm sensing enemies up ahead, Genesis murmured, crouching down to prevent enemies from seeing him. He then lifted a hand at Blastion Xanthos, and using his light magic to contort photons around the two, Soon they became invisible to the naked eye. Now they just had to wait. Two shadows slowly began to grow on the walls, heralding the arrival of two people unknown to the heroes. Suddenly, a claw made of bone tore out the ground, grabbing Genesis and throwing him roughly against the rock tunnel wall, knocking him out. The light-based camouflage around Xanthos and Blastion dissipated, revealing their position to none other than Charisma. She grinned sadistically and began to walk towards them, a mass of undead rising from the rocks as she did so. Xanthos felt heat fill his face as Charisma approached him. Her perfume was intoxicating, and Xanthos struggled to keep himself conscious. She cooed softly in his ear trying to sway him to join her, to leave his heroic path for a thirst of power and corruption. He had tried to close his eyes, tried to block her out, but the temptation was so alluring. Wait, so we're not gonna get to hear what she said to him? A thing that's so alluring you can bring him to the dark side? Alright, I guess I'll, uh, I'll just imagine that one. A fireball rocketed past Xantho's face, destroying the rock tunnel wall behind him. Blastion lowered a finger, grunting as Xanthos returned to his senses. The cat then clasped his hands together, feeling his connection with nature rise exponentially. His eyes flared open, the crimson lightning pouring out of his body like serpentine tendrils. The lightning ravaged the undead horde, allowing Blastion to finish them off with pinpoint accurate fireball sniping. The tendril quickly stopped an inch from her face as Charisma grinned as she saw Xanthos hesitate. That would be all the time she needed. A mass of undead bodies surrounded Xanthos and trapped him in a body-tight cage, immobilizing him for the battle. Charisma laughed wickedly. <laughs> Two down, one to go. Her gaze was now set upon Blastion, who was now becoming worried. Don't give up! Xanthos shouted from his confines, still struggling to break free. Blastion ran towards Charisma, front-flipping in front of her to strike her with his tail. She kicked upwards, her skates blocking his lava tail. She then spun forward, curling herself into a spiny ball and striking Blastion right in the chest. He fell backward, head clutching his chest in pain. The necromantress was strong, much stronger than he had anticipated. He couldn't hold back anymore. He spun quickly, slamming Charisma in the stomach with his tail before he backpedaled several steps. He closes his eyes. His tail arced around him protectively. A shield of lava. Somewhat clear in appearance, surrounded him as he began to chant. Zu, ni, ha, ji, zau, hoi. As Blastion spoke each word, the lava began to grow thick and hard, compressing itself only slightly. The shield itself seemed to pulse like a heartbeat. Blastion's eyes snapped open, a whirlwind of air blasting past the shield and blowing Charisma back as Blastion finished the incantation. Rah! The lava also released its energy, tidal waving through the tunnel right towards Charisma in large volumes. The surprised necromancers began to run, unable to dodge or negate the stream of lava. 
A sudden wave of water materialized in front of Charisma, shielding the necromantis from the lava. As the lava and water battled each other in the tunnel, Charisma could hear an insane giggle behind her. She turned slightly, seeing Scum slowly approach, his eyes crazed. The two grinned as Scum lifted his arm, where a blue ring was fitted to his arm. The water instantly vanished as the ring blazed with a blue aura, the lava already hardened and cooled. Charisma lifted an eyebrow, amused by the hero's feeble retaliation. They were nothing but flies for her to squish. She lifted a hand, and dozens of undead monsters rose from the lava, their bones glowing with volcanic light. Charisma muttered two words softly, her voice laced with poison. Finish them. Chapter 6 This next one the creator admits seems iffy. Let's be on our toes. To live is to die. To die is to live. It is impossible for one to turn back the hands of time. Or so you may think. Some say time is but an illusion. Others believe it to akin to omnipotence. Perhaps they were right. Perhaps they were wrong. But in the depths of the underground cavern, the Chronostone did not care for such trivial thoughts. It could sense beings of great... Oh, so we're getting a perspective of the stone. This is interesting. I didn't know the stone was a character. It could sense beings of great power above, fighting valiantly, but not realizing the outcome of their hopeless struggle. In the claws of time, they would be forever forgotten, forever alone. History would speak of their feats, but would never be able to reimagine their souls. The stone knew they were coming, as it had known for years since its very existence. They only saw it as a tool, a weapon of mass destruction, an object of never-ending power. Never even considering that the stone was so much more. Its home had been with Celestio Sapien race, the only species that truly understood with the depths of its power. After all, the Celestio Sapiens were the ones who forged much of the universe. It was said that whoever held the Chronostone held the world. Any wish could be granted. Any dream could become a reality. Bring back the deceased was no issue for the stone at all. Made by the powerful entity Kronos, the stone was made so only those with pure intentions can utilize its true power. Then, those people came, lesser beings who competed for its power. The very same who fought over the stone today. They thought it they can control it. They thought it would be easy. But great power comes with a great price, and there would be no greater price to pay than the one that would take place in a few short hours. Back at Jennifer's headquarters, many could not shake the feeling of the ominous foreshadowing in the heavy air, especially Juliet, a female hedgehog who worked as a secretary of sorts, organizing missions for the Alliance of the Justice as Jenna forced to take on. Her concern right now was the 3D holographic monitor before her. The screen displayed five members who were at building 20.12. Genesis, Luna, Xanthos, Speedster, and Blastion. All of these members had taken communicators to speak to each other and the headquarters. It also allowed Julia to check their vitals as the mission continued. She fixed her gaze on Genesis' icon, which had suddenly darkened a few minutes ago. Why is Genesis' icon dark? Juliet turned around in her chair to see her younger sister, Emily, and Alex Law walking towards the monitor. Juliet felt her throat nut up and was unsure of what to say. Usually, that meant the person was dead, but wasn't Genesis the strongest member of Geniforce? <laughs> Maybe he's breaking now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will continue. I'm not sure... Juliet finally muttered, returning her attention to the monitor and tapping several keys on the keyboard furiously. Her hand flew across the keyboard as Juliet tried to figure out what happened. Juliet then brought forward her several camera recordings from the building, trying to see where the group of heroes was. Maybe we should search for them, Alex said as he crossed his priestly robe sleeves. I'm starting to... Th Wait, there's a distress signal from Luna! Juliet was now growing more and more concerned. They had to go help. Look, we can get Oblivion, Poinsettia, you, me, Spirit, and Rave to go and help. We'll meet back up at the lab, Alex replied. Is that a really good idea? Genesis report said those villains were terribly strong. 
Emily muttered softly. So are we, Alex said confidently as he thumped his chest, revealing the hand-claw weapon he adorned. We faced tough foes before. The heroes always win, right? Uh, uh, dash. I guess that means later. Is this everyone? Poinsetta asked as she looked over all that were present. Juliet and Emily had just entered the lab with a male hedgehog. The male had brown quills, but the rest of his fur was black. His crimson sunglasses rested on his forehead, and he wore a black jacket and sweatpants. Two slim, matching blades were strapped to his back, and his green eyes surveyed the lab carefully. We've brought Oblivion with us. Who the fuck is Oblivion? New target? Emily grinned to Poinsetta, who had now recognized the new member of Geniforce. Poinsetta then took note of Alex, talking to a masked man in the back. A man wore a black suit and white gloves, and little else worth noting. Poinsetta slowly approached the man, wanting to confirm his identity. Your spirit, right? The Celestio Sapien? The masked man turned around to face Poinsetta, studying her carefully. Spirit? Who's this guy? I don't know this guy. Somebody lose my memo? Use it as a napkin for the coffee? Ah, <sighs> whatever. The one and only. Spirit replied, his voice soft yet powerful. Where's Rave? Alex muttered aloud, realizing that the Falcon Echidna hybrid was missing. So sorry, everyone. At that moment, Rave had opened the door, panting heavily. Juliet and Emily sighed in unison. They really have to bring someone like this along. It was crazy. First, there was this rock that had weird amount of lumps, so I ha It's fine, Poinsetta muttered as she glanced at Rave distastefully. We have our team, and we might not know where we're going. Everyone, we might not return from this mission the same as before. Poinsetta looked over everyone present, all had eyes of full determination, and were ready for anything they had to face. Let's move out. And that closes out the episode for today. So now, not only do we get more action in an interesting relationship between a good guy and a bad guy, we get more characters as well. These characters have formed sort of a B-team to help out their friends. The only thing that bothers me about this is that we have too many characters to keep track of now, even though they have their own personalities and gimmicks, so it seems. With the addition of two new targets, to me anyway, everyone is new to you, this research project is starting to get bigger than what I expected. Regardless, I will continue with my studies and hope you'll come back for the second-to-last reading of Broken Genesis. Bye-bye, Earthlings!